committed to a gospel of Jesus that insists that the kingdom of God wants equity, justice, <coughs> communities where people can grow into the fullness of the God-given lives that they have. The law of the land now is that an employer cannot discriminate against the person <coughs> because of mental or physical impairment, because of color, because of creed, because of national origin, or because of gender. That's the law of the land. I wonder what would happen, for example, if the Black Workers Center would in its con contest with construction workers who will not hire, construction companies would not hire, did a sim symbolic, dramatic, nonviolent act of calling for the arrest of that employer for breaking the law of the land. That would be one of the ways, incidentally, to raise the consciousness of the black community about a simple issue. That is, high black unemployment is not the fault of black people. Amen. That's right. Never has been. Amen. And it is not now. Amen. It is the consequence of a system of racism that began with slavery. Amen. So all across the 20th century, we have had high black unemployment, and especially unemployment of the male. Amen. When I read papers, and especially black papers even, I don't get the sense that they understand that this system was not created because we have black folk who are immoral or lazy. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. The system was established to exploit the labor of people Amen. so that it could help to make some people wealthy. Yeah. And it's that system that we must continue to protest and fight against and change. Because we are still in the grips of a nation where racism, sexism, violence, and greed are the dominant values of the power structure. That's right. That has not changed in a hundred years or two hundred years or three hundred years. How many of you know that in 1865, the largest pool of plumbers in the country and skilled plumbers were the ex-slaves off the plantations mm. of, uh, of the southeast and south central part of the country. Mm. When four million slaves were emancipated in 1863, 1865, we were the largest body of skilled workers in the country. Mm -hmm. we, we were the electricians, the carpenters, we were oftentimes the surveyors, we were the brick masons, we were the cement workers, we were the plumbers, as I said earlier, we were the folk who put in floors, built houses, the largest group in the country. And how many of us know that one of the consequences of after the Civil War was the resurgence of white businessmen and the Ku Klux Klan that literally saw to it that a place like Terre Haute, Indiana, as a city, would not hire a black plumber or electrician or carpenter and so forth and so on. And this was a part of the pact that went on in many different sections of our country. Now, the issue for me in the 21st century is not that many people are not aware about this, aware of the issues. For me, the issue is that too many activists in the United States, including union activists, do not know how to organize their activism. To me, the biggest problem in the United States is not that people are apathetic or that we have too little activism. We have today in the United States more activism than I remember in 1950s when we were putting together this uh, uh, nonviolent direct action movement in the South. Much more activism and much more, many more problems. People see more of the economic problems. People see the, more of the problem of environmental justice. People see the issues of safety as we never saw them in the 1950s. And there are people who are com committed concerned about all of these things. So people are very much aware, much more aware than in 1950. But I maintain that the problem is that the activism is not directed in a systematic, strategic plan. 
that has a chance of producing unity, has a chance of escalating power, and has a chance of creating change. The term nonviolence was coined by Mohandas Gandhi of India. Before that time, you could not find that word anywhere, nonviolence. He uh, wanted to give a name to what he was doing. It was not running away, flight, cowardliness, as some people would have called it. He said it was not pacifism. He said it was, it was, it was resisting and fighting, but fighting from the fighting back from the position of the deepest, most humane, human values, fighting back from the perspective of love. Now, and for those of you who are religious people, almost all the scriptures in the world, including the scriptures of the Bible which you don't get very much feel for from the religious conversation in the United States. But almost all the scriptures of the world indicate that you must not imitate evil. Amen. Mm -hmm. You cannot overcome wrong with wrong. So nonviolence is basically then our trying to work to create struggle and change not only in a way that we do not imitate the evil we hate, but in which we ourselves become larger and stronger and better people. Often it began with small group of people, but it can become then a massive movement, diligence, and discipline, and effort. So the first step begins with ordinary people like ourselves. The second step of nonviolence is to create a community like you're doing here. Yeah. It's very important to practice nonviolent compassion and care, conversation, yeah. language with yourselves, with each other. Uh, I'm, I want to give you a, a, a reference from the scriptures because while Gandhi is the father of nonviolence, it can be said. The theory of nonviolence, the philosophies of nonviolence, are extremely ancient. Uh, I will give you a reference to Matthew 5, 38, 48 in the New Testament, the words of Jesus. In that passage of scripture, you'll not recognize it because it is there where it says, you have heard a set of old, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Um, a very famous passage. Um, Gandhi said, well, if you go eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, very soon everyone will be blind and toothless. But in that passage, Jesus is not saying be a coward or run away. Jesus is saying in the passage, we live in the Roman Empire. And you can see the Roman soldiers around Galilee where he was talking. And what Jesus is saying is, you may not be able to change the policies of the Roman Empire, but you do not have to live taking the Roman Empire into your own heart. You have the power to say yes or no in a quiet way to the Roman Empire. You don't have to imitate them. So in this passage he says, do not, do not violently resist the evildoer. Do not take an eye for an eye with the evildoer. Uh, a wonderful book on that passage is by Howard Thurman, a black mystic and preacher. wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited. And he said, what you rarely hear black preachers or white preachers ever talk about, and I can speak because I've known this passage of scripture all my life. He said that Jesus provides a survival kit the gospel of Jesus is a survival kit to the people whose backs are up against the wall. And I go on to say, so that you can own your own life regardless of the environment in which you live. Mm -hmm. Now that was a major contribution of Gandhi. He said, every human being, even in the worst government, every human being 
has the power in their heart, in their lives, to say yes or no. Part of the power of nonviolence is in how people use the power that is within them to say yes or no and to join with other people and creating a power that will then change the status quo. So I've talked too long, but that's all.